Good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, today for joining this, uh, the first uh, uh, webinar that we have organized uh, along with Marg Institute and organized along with uh, uh, Garmini Korea Foundation. Uh, today we have uh, Professor Tilak Abesina, who is the research director of Garmini Korea Foundation and also happens to be a member of the Marg Institute. Uh, is presenting a very interesting subject today about Corona and how it has uh, affected some key sectors or subsectors. And after that, we will have uh, three discussions. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Sirima Laberatnu has not joined us as yet, uh, but we will have Dr. Uh, Harsha Trupanu, who is the lead ec economist of World Bank in Sri Lanka and Maldives who also is a member of the Garmini Korea Foundation, and Dr. Nevis Moraes, who is the uh, faculty member or dean of the Faculty of Humanities in the, uh, at the Open University. And also, uh, Dr. Moraes is a uh, governing council member of, Mar of the Marg Institute. So, um, sorry we took a little bit of time to start uh, because we had some technical difficulties and some of our participants were unable to join in uh, sharp on time. So I'm not going to take any more time of your time. I will hand this presentation now over to uh, Professor Pilar uh, Abe Singer. Professor, I'm going to make you uh, the host now so that you can uh, share your screen if you need to. Yeah. Okay, um, I will open the slides. Okay, um, can you see the slides? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I can. See. Yeah, we can see. Yeah. We can see. Yes. Okay, so uh, I will make a, a short presentation um, because the paper is already up in the Garmin Ukraine Foundation website. It also went into some circulation and uh, Daily Mirror also picked it up and <clears throat> um, published in uh, on June 17th. So after doing this study, I um, did further, a uh, little bit further work uh, for the purpose of policy analysis and I will present that towards the uh, end. <clears throat> Basically, um, if I look at the uh, background, uh, uh, initially, but failed. But Sri Lanka chose saving lives first. But as many other countries did, um, uh, very drastic measures like lockdown and curfew, uh, airport closed and all that. So how would this affect um, the economy? So what I have done is to look at 15 major sectors of the Sri Lankan economy. <clears throat> so I looked into two scenarios. One is an optimistic scenario, which means um, the COVID outbreaks wither away, go away uh, after roughly after the third quarter of this year. This was a sort of widely expected um, scenario, especially in Asian countries. Um, and then a, a pessimistic scenario is where uh, COVID outbreaks uh, continue to happen. Now, I, initially I thought this would be a less likely scenario, but just looking at around the world now, it looks like a second wave is coming. Now in the US, just day before yesterday, they had a recorded number of cases, especially places like Houston and all that. Uh, they have run out of ICU beds and they have run out of people to help with uh, contact tracing. Australian Prime Minister announced that they may keep the country borders closed for until mid next year. Uh, China, Japan. So there's a possibility of uh, second waves. I hope this would not happen in Sri Lanka. So let's hope for the optimistic scenario to prevail. <clears throat> now the question is how to assess COVID-19 growth impact without data. For this, we need a forward-looking methodology. So what I did was I have already um, uh, done some work in the past uh, develop an econometric methodology which has well accept, which is well accepted uh, internationally now. 
I modified that methodology to account for this problem. <clears throat> Basically, what I have done is to combine two types of estimates. One is um, we have to account for the sectoral interdependence. Uh, so I estimate this using pre-crisis data. So data until 2019, quarterly data until 2019, fourth quarter. And for the COVID effect, I introduced something called an intervention variable, which is nothing but a dummy variable uh, to account for COVID effect. But the COVID effect parameters have to be calibrated. For that, I use two key exogenous variables. One is the so-called foreign GDP. That is the export share weighted GDP growth of Sri Lanka's trading partners. Basically 61 uh, economies, including the rest of the world. And then of course, visitor growth. Now, making assumptions about visitor growth for the next three quarters, the uh, first three quarters of 2020 is not difficult. In the first quarter itself, uh, there was an actual drop of 18% uh, because of the uh, travel restrictions in the second quarter, 100% um, drop. Third quarter, I assume there is no uh, visitor arrivals. Even if the government opens up the, uh, the, the uh, airport, I think um, fear of travel still may persist. But as for foreign GDP, it is anybody's guess. Um, we don't know exactly what's likely to be. But I assume minus 1% for the first quarter of this year, minus 3% for the next two quarters. Now, some people who read the article said, oh, these, these numbers are too uh, conservative. And I agree. I played with some other numbers, but that does not affect the basic outcome of the exercise. Uh, it affects only the severity of the downturn. Now, here, we can see the major sectors that I'm looking at in the Sri Lankan economy. So these are the GDP shares of um, the 15 sectors. As you can see, manufacturing is the largest. Information and communication is the smallest. I want to um, point out a few uh, 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 points on this. Now, Sri Lanka's information and communication sector is only 0.7%, very, very small. If you look at Hong Kong, it's 3.3%, Singapore 4.1%. Now, there are studies done in the US and they show substantial contribution to productivity growth from IT sector, especially after 1995. Uh, the second point is in Hong Kong, manufacturing sector shrunk uh, to the bottom uh, because of industrial hollowing out. Learning from that, Singapore is trying hard to retain the manufacturing sector dominance uh, there is something to learn there for Sri Lanka as well. Now, these are the two um, key variables that I use to um, uh, calibrate the numbers for COVID effect. So the, this graph is the uh, foreign GDP variable. As you can see, there is this dip. This dip, uh, that is because of the uh, uh, global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. So if you have the data for COVID-19 effect, this dip will be much bigger um, uh, later on. Now, this, this, this drop is what I'm trying to capture. Uh, I mean, not this drop, but uh, the COVID drop is what I'm trying to capture through the so-called dummy or intervention variable. Now, this graph is showing the, uh, the visitor arrivals from 1970 onwards, just for the sake of information. It's, as you know, visitor arrivals is highly seasonal. Um, peak occurs in December, January period. But one thing to note is visitor arrivals really picked up only after the war ended, LTTE war ended. Before that, it was just pretty much flat. So these are the regression estimates. I'm not going for the 15 sectors. I'm not going to go through these numbers, but I want to highlight two points. Now this Y star variable here is the weighted uh, sum of the growth rate of the remaining sectors, for example, agricultural sector. So Y star is the remaining 14 sectors. Now, in purely from an econometric point of view, uh, estimating a good regression just using standard uh, simple regressions is going to create a lot of troubles. Therefore, I devised this method. What I have done is to create something called a, a weight, weight matrix so that uh, these uh, some econometric problems are reduced. So this Y star variable is the if effect of other sectors 
on a given sector. So these numbers are all positive, quite a lot of them are statistically significant. But one thing about this, um, these numbers, these kind of regression estimates, pretty common, common, they capture only the direct effect, direct effect. So key uh, aspect of this study is to also look into indirect effect from other sectors on a given sector. That can be done only by putting all the sector, the equations for all the sectors together and solve them simultaneously. That is exactly what I have done in the exercise. Now, here I'm going, not going to show all the 15 graphs. They are all in the paper, but I picked up four just to highlight a few points. And basically, under the optimistic scenario, V-shape or U-shape recovery is likely. But what is important to note is the prominence of the indirect effect. Indirect effect is the effect coming from other sectors. Now, if you look at manufacturing, let's say accommodation and food. This is basically restaurants and um, accommodation, uh, rest, uh, hotels and restaurants. So initially, this blue line is the uh, direct effect. Red line is the indirect effect. This gray line is the total effect. So when you look at the direct effect, direct effect is initially bigger. Accommodation and uh, food because of the airport is closed, no tourists, this is expected. But as time go by, indirect effect takes over because other sectors are also falling that affect this sector. Same applies to manufacturing. There are two sectors interesting. Another result comes later, which you haven't seen um, in the previous paper. Now, admi uh, public administration, defense and social security and health sector. Um, direct effect is even mildly positive. It is the indirect effect that generates this uh, uh, negative effect. Almost the indirect effect. Under the pessimistic scenario, L-shaped drag happens. What I have done is in the, in the previous graph, I have put the base numbers. Base numbers is for a one unit shock. You can think of it as a one percentage growth shock. So these numbers have to be multiplied by some reasonable number to get a more realistic assessment. So what I have done is to multiply the base numbers by 10 to generate these numbers so that you can see, um, uh, you, you get a better picture. Now, I have um, uh, ranked these uh, uh, sectors according to the first year effect. This is the 2020 effect. Construction sector comes up with minus 16% contraction. Uh, this is something a bit difficult to explain, but accommodation and food services sector, we know is because of travel restrictions, is the next largest. As you go down here, education, utilities, these are not much affected. <clears throat> if you take these numbers and then take the uh, implied GDP growth effect is minus, point, uh, minus, point, uh, minus 4.3%. If the COVID-19 outbreaks continue, if the country has to close down, just like Australia is thinking or US governors are uh, saying that uh, they should not uh, open immediately, if that kind of a scenario comes to Sri Lanka, then the negative effect going to continue. That's the pessimistic. Now the question which I did not address in the paper, this uh, discussion today is mainly for this purpose, policy options. Some sectors may take more than two years to recover fully. So therefore, it is too much of a drag. Therefore, we need policy interventions to expedite the recovery process. Question is how to stimulate the economy. We already have a big debt problem. Now, just to um, add a little bit onto this, I looked at a sector specific approach. If, if the policymakers want to take a sector specific approach and also the global value chain impact. So I have a couple of slides here. So in the previous exercise, I, we saw the indirect effect affecting a given sector. So I thought, what would be the effect of a given sector on other sectors? So this graph I prepared later on. It comes out very interesting. So this basically sees how a given sector affect all the other sectors. Health, residential care and social security, public administration, defense and uh, social services. So these two sectors actually have a positive influence on other sectors. Positive influence on other sectors. Here I did not take into account as a result of the COVID effect, 
the expenditure in these two, two sectors you know have gone up i did not take into account account that if i take that into account these sectors actually create a positive impact on the economy other sectors of course uh, impact is like this uh, the sector that affects other sector the most is accommodation and food services sector so if you were to focus on a, a sector specific approach this would be some useful information to consider the other is the global value chain participation network i thought this would be useful i took this from another study uh, you cannot see this very clearly this is basically a hub and spoke diagram uh, uh, this see that these are the hubs like china germany us in asia japan singapore all these are the hong kong these are the hubs and these lines are the spoke, <coughs> spokes and you can't see properly sri lanka is here and india is here india has links a lot more than sri lanka but sri lanka is pretty much uh, disconnected in terms of global value chain sri lanka is pretty, pretty much disconnected so at this point this may be a blessing in disguise i thought blessing in disguise because global value chain is very badly disrupted at this stage it may not have a big effect on sri lanka so i will stop here and open up for policy discussion ama back to you ama yeah yes yeah. uh before we go for a general discussion um, can i ask uh, uh, dr harsha trupana to comment on uh, professor pilak presentation uh, any points shall we refine uh, yes thank you tilak kalama discussion to policy uh, policy interventions uh, yes so first let me thank tilak for a very interesting and stimulating presentation and also the paper that underlies the presentation is very interesting it's got very rich econometric analysis and i particularly like the three uh, approaches the fact that you tilak looked at the direct, direct impacts on uh, on on uh, on basically the outcome on growth you looked at also the indirect impact of other sectors on sectoral growth and the indirect and and the, and the direct Im and the indirect impact of a sector on other sectors so i think that's a very complete and comprehensive analysis in terms of policy options i think there are different ways of looking at it looking of uh, discussing the policy options i'll just mention some of those possible approaches and then leave it to the general discussion as to how uh, different approaches might give ideas that are important for policy makers so first uh, when we talk of the sectors uh, we should also keep in mind that um, in each of these sectors there are impacts that actually come in terms of either widening inequality increasing vulnerability uh, increasing poverty uh, because we do know that when growth is negative in periods of negative growth and we do know that particularly when pandemics have hit countries in the past we have seen increasing uh, poverty we have seen increasing inequality and we have seen uh, also increasing vulnerability so depending on the sector the impact on poverty inequality and vulnerability uh, would be different but of course they would all have an impact a lot depends on the on the distribution of labor in those sectors and particularly if the sectors are low are using low skilled labor the probability is that that the impact on vulnerability and poverty will be higher in those particular sectors so that's one aspect of policy that's worth thinking about and considering the other aspect of policy is also to look at different economic and social groups so we do know that the pandemic affects the elderly very badly they are most at risk of contracting the illness and if they can do contract the illness of fatalities uh, the pandemic also has a disproportionately negative impact on women compared to men the pandemic also has an impact particularly through its negative growth effects 
on the labor market and that i think will be the most disruptive in the world as a whole as well as in sri lanka if we see an l shaped uh, pattern where where basically recovery takes many years to come so the young particularly those who are going to join the labor market in the next few years will find it difficult to get jobs as well as the fact that many people who held jobs may lose their jobs or may have to take reduced incomes and in some cases small and medium businesses also closed down so there is a big impact on the labor market and a lot will depend in each sector as to how labor intensive that sector is and how human capital intensive that sector is as against uh, low skilled labor so that's one way of looking at possible policy or policy options uh, well first of policy challenges and then ways of trying to address those policy challenges so that's another aspect and then also of course there is the macroeconomic dimension so on the one hand uh, because growth is negative it's important for public intervention to stimulate the economy but this will require fiscal stimulus package on the other hand with negative growth and low government revenue fiscal space becomes limited and in countries that have high debt to gdp ratios or are highly uh, debt debt laden then again the possibility of fiscal fiscal stimulus through for example uh, borrowing and spending is highly constrained and then also there is the fact that the foreign exchange uh, foreign exchange flows become limited uh, with export industries decreasing and export revenues falling uh, there is also a negative impact on the ability to import and this also constrains the overall stimulus packages that are possible because in most cases exports also use imports as inputs and also in many cases if imports are constrained then uh, food prices for example could rise if food imports are constrained and that increases the cost of labor which undermines competitiveness of the economy and then also there is the fact that uh, monetary policy needs to be used but if again we have a, a highly debt laden economy then the, the scope for monetary stimulus is also limited so the, how then this one actually respond using fiscal policy and monetary policy given the constraints that are being faced so this is again something that it would be useful to hear from the participants as to how governments including the government of sri lanka would be able to stimulate the economy using the instruments available but within the context of the constraints that these instruments face so those are some comments and some suggestions for our policy discussion essentially three areas uh, looking at the macroeconomic framework looking at the impact on different vulnerable blue groups like the elderly women and young job seekers and then looking at it also in terms of the impact on poverty vulnerability and inequality so let me turn it over to you amar to to invite the other participants thank you uh, professor tilak would you like to respond to that or you prefer oh, no. that, that we yeah so then i'll uh, ask uh, dr morat uh, to unmute yourself and uh, uh, okay thank you amar and thank you prasit tilak for this very interesting analysis uh, although as you say it is uh, the figures are conservative uh, but but uh, as for insights i think this uh, analysis is very useful and uh, uh, and we can have a lot of policy discussion arising out of this uh, analysis uh, i also would like to agree with uh, dr harsha on how uh, he touched on various sectors various uh, markets that uh, that will undergo that has some, that have undergone changes and will have an impact on the overall performance of an economy uh, in my opinion i would like to point out two things one is uh, uh, from the macro perspective 
uh, Sri Lanka is being a small open economy. We, we still depend uh, nearly 20% of the GDP is contributed by, by export. And uh, as you know, this export recovery depends on uh, uh, mainly on the recovery of uh, the foreign export sector, the foreign partners. So basically, this is very much known to everybody that our export partners, uh, the Western countries, uh, the US and India, mostly, and all these countries are still experiencing severe, severe crisis. Therefore, this whether we will see a U-shaped recovery is uh, questionable, even in the uh, even in the next year, I would say. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, that is a fundamental prerequisite that if we want to improve our export sector, the external sector and external demand should be should be should be recovered and should be increasing so that is unlikely to happen but on the other hand if you if you look at the domestic sector now taking from uh, all what uh, dr harsha commented uh, the most important sector is actually the sme sector which which has undergone a severe kind of a depression uh, for the past uh, three to four months uh, because uh, we know very well, you know, it is, these are small, small uh, firms that uh, with uh, limited capacities and uh, in the absence of uh, national strategy to uh, back up their working capital and uh, various other requirements. And uh, they have almost gone out of business and uh, it is almost 80% of the, uh, of the economy and also employs a large number of people. So it's connected with labor market as well so in order to bring this sector out of this uh, slum a lot of policy interventions will be needed the current policy intervention such as the saubakia uh, doesn't seem to be working for all and uh, this that enabling environment has not still been created in order for this sector to revive therefore a lot of policy interventions will be needed uh, to take this sector out of this uh, slum or whatever the fear, particularly working capital and also they, they should start hiring people. So that will have beneficial impact on the labor, labor market. And, uh, and on, the, on going back to the export sector, now uh, Professor Tilak pointed out that certain sectors are insignificant, for example, the ICT sector, but on the other hand, if I look at the statistics and also policy formulations of Sri Lanka, uh, our projections are uh, to invest more on ICT and also BP, a business process management sector, uh, which uh, and also transport and logistics, uh, which are identified as the key uh, key sectors, which have a lot of promising. Uh, promising sectors in the future and a lot of investments are to be made in these two sectors but uh, we would like to hear more from you you know how do you actually see the potential of these two sectors in the context of uh, the COVID-19 and its aftermath so I would uh, I would like to stop there with those few comments uh, maybe we can take up other issues uh, the rest of the discussion. Amar, yes. Yeah, Professor, I would you like to respond uh, to those uh, no. points that were raised. I Nobody also had the same question uh, about the ICT sector. I felt that ICT sector has, uh, uh, it has, uh, it's related to other sectors also. Uh, uh, so, the growth in ICT sector will affect all other sectors uh, as we go on. That's one question, one point. And the other thing is, it's, it's a sector that can pick up very quickly, uh, uh, unlike other sectors, because the structures are in place. There are organizations that are already working uh, with um, other countries, other suppliers, uh, other other clients or whatever, not suppliers, but 
so that's a that's a, a point that which uh, point which uh, Dr. Moraes also raised. Uh, uh, that is something that we could discuss as we go on. But I think uh, would you like to first uh, respond to what uh, Arsh and uh, Dr. Moraes pointed? Uh, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, ICT sector, as I see, I mean, this because now the global um, value chain linkages happen through this sector. Um, I mean, just to give you a very uh, simple example, like in Singapore, um, uh, digital x rays are not examined by doctors in Singapore because it's one thing is expensive and also takes time. So they immediately send to India and result comes within one hour. So you get to see the results pretty much immediately. But in Sri Lanka, do we provide these kind of services to other countries? So this is where the development of IC sec ICT sector uh, will, how it's going to contribute to our economy. So I think uh, the current government is also quite keen on developing ICT sector. That also going to play a very major role in the global value chain uh, linkages. Now, in general, all the points that um, Har um, Harsha and uh, Navis uh, pointed out, uh, I think is, is uh, very, very uh, valuable points. Um, now, <clears throat> given the severe debt problem Sri Lanka is facing, you know, how to stimulate the economy is, is a big question. Uh, my personal take at this stage is uh, the still don't know how the world economy is going to look like. Therefore, stimulating the export sector has a big question mark. But can we stimulate the domestic demand? Uh, that's, uh, you know, um, to keep the economy going, domestic demand. So here, I think, uh, uh, is to, people have to spend. To spend, they need money in their hands. If people spend, that creates the multiply effect. So at least, you know, the domestic demand keeps uh, the small, medium-sized businesses uh, going. Now, how to inject money? Like during the restrictions, you know, uh, people were so much, you know, uh, uh, cash trapped, you know, they didn't have money to spend. Now the economy is somewhat open and how to get money to the hands of these people? That's, that's a big question. If they have the money, they will spend, that will create the multiply effect. So stimulating the domestic economy, I think, uh, is perhaps uh, is a better option because it's the outcome of more predictable than uh, the external uh, sector. Now, um, one thing I uh, suggested to you, Amma, even in a previous discussion, is that I think this is the time we have to use this uh, so-called moral suasion, you know, uh, <laughs> because uh, the companies, uh, you know, uh, small and medium-sized companies, uh, instead of laying off workers, if they tell the workers, okay, we keep you, but get ready to accept a lower wage. So the workers should also be ready to accept a, accept a lower wage. So if you are kicked out of the work, you have no money at all. But if you are kept in the job at a lower wage, you have uh, a job going, you get some money to spend. So that will, so we had the government has to use this moral suasion. Actually, we saw this is not difficult because we saw how the innate goodness of people came out in Sri Lanka during COVID-19. So we, we could utilize the same same thing, you know, uh, uh, tell uh, companies convincingly uh, the moral suasion thing convincingly. Do this, you know. Um, don't lay off the workers, you know, to keep them, and uh, workers accept lower wages. Um, yes, um, Navis, you had some other point I forgot um, about, apart from the ICT sector, what was the other sector? Uh, the transport and logistics also identified as a promising sector, uh, which could earn a lot of revenue to Sri Lanka. A lot of investments are projected on that. Uh, but in your sectoral analysis, I, I, I don't know whether that that uh, you were able to uh, capture that sector as yeah, well. Yeah. In terms of the last uh, uh, couple of slides, the, the slide before the last slide I had, you know, influence of a given sector on other sector, I think transport sector has a bigger okay. impact. Actually, ICT sector also has a bigger impact on other sectors. So is the transport sector. So it makes a lot of sense uh, to uh, 
prioritize these sectors if we now uh, the harsha's points about you know um given the debt problem you know macroeconomic policies fiscal expenditures i have no answer to these questions <laughs> let's open it up for the uh, the others <clears throat> Professor, there are two questions. Actually, Sangha has asked two questions. One is, uh, are we looking at recovery back to how things were? Is Sri Lanka able to take the opportunity that COVID-19 has presented and look at how we could build back better? For example, with more concern for inequality and the environment. And the second question is, have remittances from the Middle East been affected? And if so, to what extent? I don't know whether we could answer question number two because maybe it is too early. Uh, or do you have any figures uh, which you could uh, elaborate on? But uh, could you respond to these two questions? I don't have uh, figures, but uh, the drastic drop in remittances because a lot of Sri Lankans who came overseas, they came back. Uh, so. Uh, the foreign exchange earnings that Sri Lanka had, you know, has gone down drastically as a result. Now, how, um, you know, uh, to unravel this, uh, we still don't know because uh, these people have to go back to the countries where they have been working and then restart, you know, sending money back. So impact of remittances on the economy, I haven't looked at it, but I think uh, obviously uh, the impact is likely to be quite, quite uh, drastic. Uh, on the families itself, you know, the families were spending the money sent by the people who are working overseas. So again, you know, uh, there's no spending, no multiply effect. Um, environment, <laughs> that's, that's tough because, you know, we all know during COVID period, you know, the environment was getting better. Now, you know, things are going back to normal, the pollution and all that's restarting. So without uh, very active policy interventions on this, you know, uh, uh, protecting the environment, uh, and people forget all these things and, you know, things go back to usual, you know. You can see when you drive on the road, how many smoking vehicles, you know, uh, run on the streets. So this really needs a very, very uh, strong, effective policy actions, policy interventions. Yeah, Amma. Uh, there's a question from Neil uh, De Silva, who is also a member of Marvin Institute. Uh, I think you have met him. Uh, Ask them to give solutions, not questions. <laughs> uh, what is the role of Institute? Sorry. Uh, what is the impact that skilled workers coming from the Middle East to our job market? What, what is, I think, if I'm to rephrase that question, what would be the impact that skilled workers who come uh, who are coming from the Middle East, where they lost their jobs, what will it do to our uh, job market? Well, of course, if they are not going back, if they are looking for jobs in Sri Lanka, so that's, uh, you know, you will see because the economy is not picking up. So as a result, there will be, uh, you know, unemployment issue to solve. Apart from that, of course, the remittances they have been sending goes down. That has an effect on foreign exchange earnings. Also, the money they have been sending to families, as I said, said earlier, uh, you know, uh, dried. And as a result, that doesn't create any um, expenditure impact on the economy. So there are effects are multiple. Yeah, I think as I estimate the, the Middle East income, the remittances amount to nearly 7 billion a uh, year. So that will have serious implications on the uh, foreign exchange, like our balance of payment will be affected. And it also will have a severe impact on the household welfare, household expenditure situation. So that uh, in terms of hiring them locally, we, we don't know. We Because they went abroad partly because they were they did not find employment here. So when they come back, we don't know whether employment will be there, uh, whether they'll be able to find the, uh, the right places. Uh, so that that is 
certainly that will have that will have an impact on unemployment uh, that's a likely likely impact very much likely yes to the next question asanga are you uh, you have any more comments or uh, do you want to respond to what uh, professor tilak said or we can go okay we can go to uh, uh no, 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 that's fine we can move no, on fine. okay yeah. uh so there's another question that uh, mr vijaytunga has uh, raised uh i'm not too sure whether i understand the question he says what is the role of the institute operating at national provincial and local level in the context of 15 sectors uh Vijay, would you like to unmute yourself and ask this question? Uh, maybe yeah. Maybe you ask it better. Yeah, Professor Tilak, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, my question is related to the institution operate at national local institution operate at national and uh, local and uh, regional level because all these sectors finally depend on the institution. Unless you train the institution, you can't expect any growth with regard to this sector, this sector. So clear? Ah, uh, not clear. Ah, uh, Vijay. Yeah. I can't hear. We can't hear you clearly. Something. Meanwhile, Kitsiri has a question for you. Sri Lanka. Yes, Yeah, it says uh, Sri Lanka exports to developed markets, which has now achieved successful living with COVID-19 status, could be reviewed, revived faster than supply to some of the local consumer markets. Can can the experts yeah. comment on this? Silver lining in the dark cloud is that because the world trade has to continue, because you know. the world is so interdependent so therefore countries uh, haven't closed doors for um, uh, world trade so so trade has to continue so um, uh, it is the the uh, people movement that really really got uh, restricted so hopefully um, the current uh, drop in world trade uh, will disappear quickly and pick up very quickly hopefully and i think almost all the countries are interested uh, in that to see uh, the world trade is picking up and international institutions like um, international labor organization and all that are, are urging countries to you know um, uh, get back to um, you know get the world trade going yep kitsuri okay with that anything anything you want to add anything uh, yeah, from your manufacturing experience uh, as well that documents uh just to tell you that uh, i was ceo of a local uh, smi so we really started the operations back again uh, we did it in uh, may with the confidence we got from the boi and exports companies because we were uh, we were uh, totally dependent on uh, one export uh, one buyer in india and uh, three other boi companies who started operating even before us so uh, smis who are suppliers to uh, who are connected to such networks uh, i think uh, have nothing to fear but it's the uh, ones who have been catering to the local market uh, where you can uh, expect some of the uh, non essential items uh, to have a drop because people are not buying the non essential items right now uh, probably they are keeping the money for a, a better day and uh, there was a contradictory view somebody saying that uh, workers can uh, keep the employment at a lesser salary w- what are you trying to do because the moment you try to do that you are uh, allowing the consumer uh, markets to shrink further so it will hit back so it it has a negative effect on the uh, economy uh, though you temporarily see a, a opportunity for them to keep the uh, employment so i think it is the responsibility of every uh, ceo manager entrepreneur uh, to keep their uh, workers uh, working and give them the uh, fair salary continue to give them the fair salary if they 
take that effort, then only you can really revive the uh, economy. I'm not an economist, but uh, this is how I understand economics. Uh, Kisri, see, it's, it's an option of laying off the worker completely, you know, he has no income versus keeping the worker at a low, because the company's problem is, you know, they ca cannot sustain, they cannot go on because after paying wages and all that, you know, meeting the expense, they, they have no any profit left over. So that's why I said, if companies are ready to keep the worker, instead of laying the worker completely, laying off the worker completely, keep the worker, but the, from the worker's point of view, he should be ready to accept the lower wages. So uh, I have my personal experience on this in Singapore, you know, uh, our wages were cut uh, during downturns and uh, the employment kept going. So, so that generates the, the, uh, the expenses that we are talking about to create the multiply effect I was talking about. So if you lay off the worker completely, he's completely without money. I agree with Tilak uh, on that. Uh, I mean, even what we did was uh, the worker salary consists of a basic salary and a, a production incentive. So when there's absolutely no production, uh, obviously they won't get the production incentive which accounts for nearly 40% of their monthly wages. So we kept them employed uh, even without any work uh, during the month of April and a good part of uh, May also. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's good. Before I go on, uh, I think uh, uh, Neil asked a question uh, uh, about these uh, skilled workers. Uh, we didn't get back to Neil. Uh, Neil, are you okay with the uh, response, um, Professor the problem Dr. Harsha mentioned that uh, employment now the issue is that since those people are coming to the market back because their economy is down so then they may lose in jobs there so they may come back to their own country so when they come to Sri Lanka they, the youngest who is expecting the, the seeking jobs has to compete with the, these experienced skill workers so that's what my question was how to uh, the, the our young Sri Lankans enter the market competing with oh. those skill workers. Okay, I understand. I understand. I think uh, maybe you are better to answer on. I mean, <laughs> better. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know whether I'm getting the question correct. I mean, uh, do you mean to say that uh, when these uh, skilled people who migrated to Middle East when they come back? They will, uh, they will compete. Oh, yeah, the, the the, what what uh, Neil was saying that the current, the younger ones who do not have the same sort of experience now will have to compete with skilled people who, who, who are skilled and also have experience working um, outside the country. Uh, so it would Actually, when you look at the skills that migrated to the Middle East, those are very few skills, not uh, diverse skills. These are particularly uh, in the business, like uh, certain banking and uh, certain ICT skills, which are abundantly available here in Sri Lanka. There's no shortage of that. Uh, therefore, I don't think there will, there will be a severe competition like that when they come back. Uh, because uh, locally also, we do have a lot of skills in, in, the, in the like a business sector, right? ICT and business sector, which is needed by the domestic companies uh, i don't think they are I, I don't know to my understanding there won't be a severe competition uh, between those who are coming back and those who are here looking for a job on the other hand uh, i don't know whether there will be any offers for anybody in the near future if there is going to be hiring by local people i'm sure the middle east also will be hiring back so when the situation gets back to normal so there is a likelihood of these people actually going back uh, because as uh, the Lack said, the economy has to move, trade has to continue. So therefore, uh, with limitations, I think there will be movement of labor as well uh, in the way that we expect uh, uh, arrivals to improve. I, I'm sure when, when arrivals improve, certainly labor movement also is going to be possible. Any any um, ideas on you know 
like fiscal stimulus any participant like that's that's a big question like other countries rich countries uh, they have come up with big stimulus packages singapore itself you know more than 100 billion you know so it's the sri lanka doesn't have the capacity for that so what to do Harsha? There, was a, there was a fund created as we all know um, i don't know whether we could we could uh, enlighten us about the status of that fund now and, and uh, can i say something there yeah yeah yeah, that is uh, now uh, SMI so promised uh, 25 million rupees uh, at a 4% interest uh, on a concessionary loan basis. It's not a grant, but it's a loan. But that never came. And uh, actually, if a uh, company like uh, where I was working, and if they received that 25 million, we would have uh, continued our business very smoothly. Because right now, their biggest problem is uh, procuring uh, raw materials, especially the raw materials that needs to be imported from uh, outside, uh, where they don't have bank facilities. Because uh, the bank promptly gave the moratoriums. So as a result of that, uh, they uh, deferred the uh, repayment of all the loans. The moment import loans are uh, deferred, uh, with that, uh, import facilities get completely blocked. That's the banking system we have. So, uh, in that scenario, you cannot import anything on a LC basis or anything unless uh, you, uh, the supplier is willing to give you DA. And uh, looking at the global situation, uh, these uh, small suppliers also are reluctant to give another uh, SMI in a Sri Lanka uh, DA basis unless they really have a very close uh, relationship. Because uh, DA means you actually really don't know when you will get the payment back, uh, because that's the that's the scenario that's uh, happening, uh, especially in Sri Lanka, uh, because the uh, moment uh, the lockdown or holiday or curfew or whatever that came in March, uh, some people requested and immediately central bank removed all the uh, restrictions on not honoring checks and also not paying. Uh, 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 not keeping money in the current accounts, all those things were allowed. So, so as a result of that, uh, uh, supply chains have now really got stuck due to the reverse flow or the cash flow not happening. So the biggest challenge is now to go to customers, collect the money and put it back in the bank and uh, get some of these facilities released. Because if the concessions from the government really came in time, there wouldn't have been any problem uh, for these companies to restart because uh, uh, the type of company which I work where monthly turnover was 25 million, if they got another 25 million uh, soft loan, uh, definitely uh, that would have been a huge boost uh, to their business. Yes. Uh, so it never came. And uh, uh, now they are saying, okay, they might give about 5 million. Uh, that again, uh, no certainty. They're just saying we we have considered and we are waiting for central bank uh, final nod. Yeah, that that, that, policy actually, uh, that policy failed. I know because that's what I mentioned. The Saubakia scheme announced by the government, which is uh, the the working capital scheme for the SME sector, which the banks uh, did not distribute. Uh, and that led to the recent controversy between central bank and the government. Uh, but the, you know, the concern from the bank banking sector is that uh, when the government announced this uh, particular scheme or whatever, uh, there has not been adequate consultation or among the, the sector, sectoral people, because the bank themselves have been deprived of uh, interest income for the past three months. Uh, because of the moratorium and various other difficulties. So they lost income, uh, they, they, everything was postponed. So in, 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 in that background only the Saubakya scheme was introduced and the banks were reluctant to distribute those loans even at a very low rate and because there was a problem of uh, guarantee. So therefore, we don't know whether that policy actually was a good policy uh, or a good policy was tried, administered in a you know bad way or whatever. So, but but when I looked at the proposals given by the Chamber of Commerce, they have, they have uh, 
prescribed so many policy uh, prescriptions on many many sectors one of the one of the suggestion is actually the the wage wage related support to smes uh, so implication is that the there could have been a separate fund uh, may not be through the banks but there could have been a separate fund from which smes uh, could draw money and you know support the wages maintaining certain level of wages of sme sector employees so there are different proposals proposed uh, but we don't know you know what what will work and what has worked asange suggested in in his chat box he said uh, can we take a, a middle path uh, uh, asange would you like to kind of uh, explain uh, your point we can take that yes ma actually i was referring to uh, uh, professor tilak uh, professor abhay singh has uh, point about say for example now even other countries are looking at rather than having a full work week uh, versus laying people off reducing the work week say for example uh, a four, three or four day work week and keeping the keeping the uh, the the Us. workers and and uh, you know kind of spreading or distributing that uh, you know that that wealth if you like so i think i was referring to actually that uh, discussion between uh, professor abhay singh and uh, kitchiri and i think i i'm more aligned to uh, what professor abhay singh is saying that you know like to look at a middle path approach rather than just like sacking everybody keep them but maybe give them uh, you know lesser amount of work but but still keep them going with uh, some sort of uh, uh means to livelihood yes yes and Maybe. also ama uh, since i've got since i've uh, i've got the speaker uh, or rather the mic i'm sorry the mic um another point i want to make uh, like it's like a partly like a observation and a question now while industries and manufacturing has been affected i think covid has also provided an opportunity in in a different sort of a manner uh of manufacturing and i'm referring to the the masks and the gloves and uh you know the the what you call the ppe kits and the face guards and a whole host of things related to related to health and hygiene and uh, and i've seen a lot of you know garment factories and even factories like dsi kind of uh, you know adapting to the situation and changing their manufacturing the processing line to Uh, produce some of these goods which are in demand now in, in not just in sri lanka and even uh, supplying it to the global at uh, the global level now for example i i know that recently there was i think unicef was uh, you know unicef the global supply unit in copenhagen uh, actually got into an agreement through boi with some of the local uh, manufacturing companies to supply certain things like pp kits and uh, gloves and masks and so on so I, i and and as ridiculous as it sounds to me because i mean these are like you know we i don't think we ever thought that you know masks and gloves will be in demand and almost like uh, an, a new addition to the fast moving consumer goods uh, but i wonder if that that is and that won't be the total solution obviously you know for recovery but i wonder if that might be, uh, provide some sort of a, uh, you know relief for some sort of a, a, a boost to the work recovery at least in the manufacturing sector and if the government could perhaps like you know, and, and as professor abhishek mentioned uh, you know the government is not in a very strong position to maybe provide like stimulus like um, other countries but at least if they can facilitate play that facilitate a role and uh, create partnerships uh, you know with global uh, at the global level for the private sector in sri lanka i wonder i wonder whether that might provide some sort of relief interesting uh, yeah. dr moras you want to respond to that i think uh, uh, what asang was saying uh, recently ixp against uh, and as i went out some there there was this la lady who was uh, you know stitching face mask and she was selling it uh, for a living uh, she used to uh sell you know little little tips things uh, uh like mock balls and stuff like that 
to make a living. Now she's uh, uh, making face masks and selling it for 50 rupees. So there is. Can I? Yes, Kitsi, uh, go ahead. There are a couple of things I'd like to say about Neil's question. I think we did not address the issue that uh, most of these people who have been badly hit by uh, COVID-19 in Middle East and various other places uh, and who has to get back to Sri Lanka are the low skilled or unskilled workers who are working, uh, doing such work uh, in those countries. Correct. Uh, so, uh, so, so therefore, this is an excellent opportunity as far as I can see uh, to retrain them. When they re reach Sri Lanka, immediately retrain them with more modern skills, uh, which are more suitable for the kind of new economic uh, activity that is going to happen elsewhere, everywhere. I think there will be a lot of more, more digitalization, more IT, more uh, IT-related work. So therefore, uh, different kind of uh, skill development is... Uh, uh, anyway, we have been preaching about it. Uh, but now this is a, a golden opportunity to uh, get something going. Uh, and that should be part of the recovery from the uh, COVID-19. That's one of the comments which I want to make about that. Then what Asanga Ranasinghe said, uh, actually it's not only making masks and uh, uh, some of these uh, PPE the things, uh, that is maybe a temporary phase because uh, once the uh, COVID-19 uh, comes under control, uh, I don't think people will be uh, wearing masks because already I noticed a lot of people are wearing them mask on the chin and not on the uh, nose or the mouth uh, so 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 that is, that may be a temporary uh, boost in demand but then but you, the cannot, you, you cannot forget you cannot forget no you cannot forget the very important aspect that came up during the covid 19 that is sri lankan engineering showed uh, what they can do they showed uh, uh, how to fabricate icu beds which were imported from other countries those were fabricated in Nigambu and supplied to the uh, additional beds they were adding to uh, these wards. And then even uh, repairing ventilators and uh, some people even started making new ventilators. So, so th that is the kind of uh, high value addition manufacturing that can be encouraged in this country. Because of the crisis, uh, they got the opportunity and they did it. But uh, commercially, even our uh, business people, uh, established businesses, never think uh, in those lines uh, to do that kind of thing in Sri Lanka. Instead, they would like to import from somewhere and collect their commission. Uh, and they are going in for government tenders. And the government tenders also do not consider uh, the local uh, ma manufacturers and suppliers uh, in their usual business. But this, because of the crisis and they had no opportunity and uh, to quickly increase, uh, they did it. And even Sri Lankan army and armed forces are quite capable of doing a lot of engineering work. Even yesterday, I think they uh, shipped some uh, uh, that buffles or buffles or whatever you may call it uh, to Mali. So, so that's uh, engineering fabrications. And that's the uh, lessons we learned during this crisis. And I think uh, policymakers should really look at hard to do at those things and uh, give encouragement for them to uh, uh, not only to uh, concentrate on the local market, but also to go even for the international markets. Thank you. Thank you, Kitsuri. Uh, certainly, there are new opportunities. There's silver lining in these rain clouds. So let's uh, hope that the policymakers will pick up these points. Professor Tilak, anything to add? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, yeah, uh, very, very, very good points uh, by everybody, so. Uh, one question I have, uh, Professor Tilak, now, in Dr. Vasanti's uh, study or report uh, that she did uh, even during the COVID-19 period, she looked at uh, the numbers of uh, various uh, sectors, how, how, mu how much, how many, uh, would be affected by COVID. Now, when you look at the sectors, you look, uh, of course you look at look at it from the GDP point of view. Uh, have you been able to look at uh, Dr. Vasanti's data also and mesh it and see what the numbers are that are affected? Because at the end of the day, policy decisions are also political. 
uh, maybe look at how many uh, not, how, how much of people are in that particular sector how they are affected no i haven't uh, looked at but this is really really worthwhile uh, thing to do because uh, 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 just counting you know uh, the number of people who are very badly affected uh, i think harsha was talking about uh, income inequality problem um, especially as a result of this uh, crisis so looking into these numbers and putting them together i think uh, i think we should do um, perhaps a quick analysis on that as well i'll, I'll take note of that note of that <clears throat> Amar? can i can i point out one ask one question actually now recently i i read a report which was uh, done through an international agency saying that uh, there has been 30% reduction in consumption among the low income groups consumption reduction which uh, could lead to malnutrition and various other other adverse implications uh, so in that context now i would i would like to ask professor tilak now one of the key sectors uh, relevant to that is the agriculture sector Now, in your analysis, uh, this is a sectoral analysis. So, were you able to, I mean, gather more information about the performance of this sector, and and uh, possible kind of uh, scenarios for for this agriculture sector, which which has multiple implications, like not only in terms of uh, consumption, uh, you know, in terms of labor, in terms of food security, and even export. Uh, Were you able to gather more information on this sector, and could you give us uh, some more insights on this? Um, no, um, agriculture sector, uh, as you saw, is not as badly affected as many other sectors. Um, also, the uh, agricultural sector's influence on other sectors is also, um, if I remember correctly, is is big. Um, but micro details, I haven't looked into this um, uh, yet. Um, the, how the farmers are affected and all that. I mean, this uh, agricultural sector is quite a uh, important, different policy agenda by itself. Uh, I think if Vasanti is there, I think she should be able to uh, comment more on the agricultural sector. I Dr. Mean, Vasanti, sorry, Dr. Vasanti, if you could uh, come in because I'm looking at how inputs, uh, agri inputs, uh, may have some sort of uh, bearing on, the, or has a bearing on. agriculture sector so i think uh, the uh, uh, lockdown would have affected agri inputs even some of the exports of agrochemicals seeds uh, uh, other implements uh, you would like care to comment on that can you hear me yep but we can't see you that's okay <laughs> yeah i was listening to the throughout the your conversation uh, as far as uh, my concern is also that the uh, agriculture sector has not that not as affected as the other sectors uh, except for the input supply being interrupted but as you, as you can remember at the beginning the private sector corporate sector has already planned for input you can't supply. can't hear what i'm can't hear not clear my question was uh, uh, will it affect the next season we come to the yala uh, will uh, sorry we are coming into maha season yeah right uh, will it affect the maha season because of uh, uh, non availability of some of the inputs agreed inputs actually with regards to fertilizer there were issues but uh, i think uh, over time these will be uh, to a certain extent will be sorted out but the okay. uh, uh, actually the domestic food sec- crop sector has not been much damaged because of this uh, crisis Ex- uh, but the export sector with tea and uh, the basic uh, exports of our whole economy has really been affected but i heard from the edb now it's really recovering yesterday i happened to talk to the edb and uh, they say now the beverage demand has uh, increased uh, in the re- reverse part of the world and therefore there will be a 
uh, increasing uh, revenue coming in from export. Uh, as you said, the input supply interruption will have an effect to a certain extent. Uh, uh, but anyway, as you say, as we all know, that if you go by the world uh, world uh, world bank uh, the export uh, trade statistics that there are no restriction with regard to import or any other uh, exports from their country. Uh, if the, the logistic uh, will be uh, to a certain extent in order, I think the supplies will reach us. So there will be, uh, although there are interrupted supply, but uh, will be, uh, we will be having these stocks uh, to a certain extent. Although there are claims of that fertilizer is not adequately uh, being uh, uh, provided with, uh, to the farmers and all, but uh, I think uh, with time that will be the situation will improve. And uh, I think one point uh, that I was wanted to raise: uh, the most affected sector of the total GDP. We know the service sector is the contributor, the highest. The agriculture sector and the service, uh, the industrial sector is just uh, less than 50%. Uh, the most affected service sector, would, how this sector would be addressed is the most uh, important uh, consideration in this whole exercise. Uh, I think the, as uh, Mr. Kitsiri pointed out, how the, the forward and backward linkages can be make use of the benefit of the new innovative uh, uh, enterpri enterprises is, is a good uh, opportunity that we have uh, we have uh, come across after this crisis. I think we have to work towards that. Uh, how because we know agriculture sector is related by the uh, backward or uh, forward linkages. How would that can make a change as well as the, how the international uh, linkages can be. Uh, make use of uh, in the value chain for the benefit of the, uh, the entrepreneurs inside the country. I think that's a very good move, get a good idea that he forwarded. Uh, I don't know whether I served your, uh, uh, the, whether I answered the question and if it's been comprehensive and so. Yeah, Dr. Tilak, Professor Tilak, can yeah. you hear me? Or? Uh, no, no, no. I was I, I was just uh, listening. Um, the service sector, if we uh, because in the study that I presented, service sector has a, the final breakdown, but industry sector, agricultural sector, I did not uh, you know go into a disaggregated uh, level. Actually, uh, Dr. Godfrey Gunatilaga pointed this to me that I should have looked at uh, you know. Uh, find a breakdown in the uh, industry sector and also agricultural sector. I, I haven't that, done that. But service sector, as you see, if I add the numbers, of course, that is uh, the most uh, severely affected. You, you are right. <clears throat> are there any more questions that, uh, that you want to raise? Sir? Not questions. We need good suggestions. I have a suggestion, but I don't think that uh, the the forum is appropriate. You know what I mean. There are certain certain sectors that have been severely affected, uh, which we know, but let's not talk about those sectors. <laughs> okay. That is that is liquor. He is referring, I think. Hmm? He is referring to liquor, I think. <laughs> no, not no something similar to liquor. <laughs> <laughs> no, professor, professor, we need a survey. Boy. We did a uh, survey uh, during the April, uh, third week of April, food stocking in the households. In that, uh, what we realized was uh, normally in households, 75%, nearly 70% are stocking chicken, but now it has come down to 20%. Uh, uh, the rice, most essential things are, was maintaining only thing that the stocking amount has gone down. But they were having rice, they were having uh, coconut, they were having chili powder. But uh, chicken and the fish, it was gone down. And But soya, it was remaining. That's all now. Someone said that uh, malnutrition. I don't think that if, if chicken is replaced by uh, soya, uh, whether that 
impact will have? You are asking a question? No, that's why I suggested that somebody said that uh, the, the validation will happen, but according to our survey, the, the people were not starving and they were eating something, but uh, instead of chicken, they were eating soya. Yeah. So they, I don't think that that is the, the most difficult time, April, third week of April. So we did that survey. Yeah. So it is. Uh, People somehow uh, got the stuff to eat uh, and the essential things. Okay. Uh, can we have one last question? Uh, I think uh, Vijay, do you want to? No, no. The problem is communication. There's a problem. Very difficult. But I put uh, Ama. Yeah. Uh, can you read the my note? The effect on underground world. Uh, nobody talk about the underground world. I think we have to talk about the underground world also. Equally. We are talking about the surface level. We are talking level. about crime and uh, in general. Yes, 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 yes. Underground world, black, black economy. All they are affected. In Sri Lanka, underground world represents at least 50 to 20 percent. Nobody talk about that. I'm the, I, I'm not asking that you'll have to answer that part, but that area also equally affected. I'm, I'm not very clear. Is it, is it you're talking about the black money, the, uh, that aspect or? Yeah, everything uh, underground world, black money, uh, even uh, some uh, exchange occurring at the underground world. All this come under the underground in developing countries such as Sri Lanka. Area is a represent somewhere 50 to 20 percent of GDP. That's my comment. Just a comment. Fill uh, up one, one question uh, mm -hmm. or, or issue. Uh, what do you think about the monetary and fiscal policy? Because uh, very crucial role of monetary policy and fiscal policy. Can you comment about that's, that's a very tough question. I was hoping yes. Arsha would have more to say on this. I think he uh, he has gone away, I guess. Um, the question is given the huge debt burden, uh, what kind of help Sri Lanka get can get from international donor agencies and things like that. Uh, I thought uh, we would get uh, some discussion on that, but uh, uh, Sri Lanka badly needs some help, uh, obviously, because of the, the debt problem. Um, and um, for that, we need very, very good suggestions. <clears throat> yeah. There were some, uh, make, sorry. I'd like to make, I'd like to make a comment about the service industry uh, that uh, I knew from some people uh, who are holding high positions in the finance, uh, financial services that uh, they had a roster for only one third of the people to come and uh, work uh, due to the uh, lockdown. Uh, but I don't think there was any drop in their productivity because other people uh, work from homes. And uh, so this is another area which uh, uh, they should relook at because if all the people are not traveling to the uh, city centers every morning, uh, I think that will solve uh, transport problem uh, and infrastructure problems also uh, to a great extent. So this is a new way of uh, looking at uh, business for the private sector as well as uh, the government should uh, uh, encourage that through their policies uh, for people to uh, work from homes uh, as much as they can. Probably uh, it's not the road network which matters. Probably we need a much better uh, broadband or communication network uh, where the Zoom conferences can be done without uh, it getting stuck uh, or uh, with all these uh, interferences uh, uh, not coming through. So if that is the case, a lot of people will be able to work from homes and uh, that will have a major impact on the national economy as well. I think the economists can comment on that. 
It's really, I agree 100%. I think we should focus more on deliverable rather than keeping how many hours you stay in the office, you know, that shouldn't matter. So focus should be on deliverable. So whether you, any work that you can do from home, just do it, but deliver on a, you know, on the given day. So your assessment is based on, your evaluation is based on deliverables, not on how many hours you spend in the office. Agree. Professor, we are pressed for time now. Uh, I yeah. think if there are more, uh, no more questions, uh, we could wind up. Uh, what I suggest is uh, we'll, uh, if uh, I will send the email uh, by Monday or tomorrow. Uh, if there are any suggestions from the participants, uh, there were some suggestions from Asanga, from Kit City, with regard to uh, training of people. There were some suggestions with regard to uh, supply chain, uh, and also from Professor, uh, from you, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Harsha. Uh, shall we uh, put that down uh, on a document? And let's see what uh, Marg Institute and the Nuclear Foundation can do with that, how, uh, how we could take it to the next level. Uh, is there any closing remarks, uh, Professor? Uh, no, no. I just want to thank you uh, for organizing this and also all, all the participants for their comments and you know spending time on this. So thank you very much. Uh, please keep uh, in, in touch with us. I will send an email to all the participants uh, you, uh, who were slight, some of oh, you all were silently listening to what was going on. But uh, please respond to our email with your comments, suggestions, and also let us know how we could improve uh, this sort of webinars in the future. Uh, I would be very much open for your suggestions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining and have a good night and stay safe. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amma. Thank you. Thank you, Amma.